Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you're doing fine. So, open root servers. Um, how many people here know it? All right, that's more than I figured. That's good. I personally only know it since like one and a half years. And uh, back then we needed a fast routing service, best API, not locally hosted. And we needed to compute three million routes as fast as possible. And um, so I found open root service. I contacted the university, and they were really kind enough to, um, to give it to us. Back then, I was working for a company. And uh, then in return, I tried to program a QGIS plugin. And fast forward, half a year, I was working for them. And it's a really nice project, and it's, um, it's a very nice team and very, very skilled. So uh, Open Root Service, it started about 10 years ago. In fact, it was uh, two th in 2008, April. So we just recently had our 10th anniversary. And um, it's a project at the University of Heidelberg from the Heigit Institute. I guess you might have seen some other talks by us. We're actually seven people here. Um, and we have, uh, there was a talk about the awesome API, so a history database. And um, so back then it was, uh, I think it was a master project or a PhD, I'm not quite sure. It was by Pascal Neitz. He's uh, still an um, active OSM contributor, as far as I'm aware. And, uh, and back then it was a Postgres solution. So it was very dynamic but it was very slow. So when it started growing, they um, wanted to try something else. And back then, the Graphhopper stack was just emerging. And when that was reliable and uh, good to use, they actually switched from uh, whatever they were using before to Graphhopper. So it's like Graphhopper, it's uh, open source. But in our case, it's entirely open source. It's uh, written in Java, the backend. And I'm not one of the core developers, so I don't know Java. Um, what I'm doing, I'm more for the client side um, programs and scripts and making use of, or best use of open root service, coming up with new ideas. Uh, it's, of course, entirely based on OpenStreetMap. So currently, there's no native. Um, support for any other road networks. But we love contributions. So if anyone has TomTom data they want to get in there, please write a wrapper. And uh, it's also, we have 2,500 requests per, for free per day for every user who wishes to subscribe and use our services. Uh, actually, we are heavily underutilized. Um, so, if you have a nice project and you know you need more than 2,500 requests, which can be a bit limiting, just contact us. You might get more. So we have uh, a stack of, in total, now it's uh, five APIs, so five endpoints, which ranges from more classical directions, right, route from A to B. Um, it's not that classical. It's a bit, uh, I would say, well, it's dynamic, right? That's the uh, title of the talk. I'm going to go into a bit more detail and um, show some examples later. And that uh, even though it's 2,500 requests per day for free, there's also some restrictions on um, how you can actually query the instances. So directions, you can only go up to 6,000 kilometers for a normal routing, a normal profile of a car. Um, and isochrones, which would be the you know, you have a point and you want to make an accessibility analysis around it using a pedestrian 30-minute walking profile. Uh, there you can go up to 100 kilometers or 60 minutes. And then we also use a geocoding API, which is really not part of um, routing. So for that, um, I'm not sure if Julian's here, but we use the Pelias um, uh, stack. So. The, if, I don't know if you heard the address interpolation talk. So that's uh, the Pelias crew, very good framework. And then we have a matrix endpoint. With that, you can basically query up to 50 by 50 locations in one go, so one request. So if you combine that with um, 2,500 requests today, you actually get 5.25 million routes. 
The disadvantage is a bit that um, you don't get the geometry returned. So it's really a precursor for routing optimization, right? So you can put an optimization engine on top and uh, solve the traveling salesman problem, just like uh, Vroom did. And then we have a POI endpoint, which is really a classical. You give any geometry in there, and you query around the geometry or within the geometry, depending on the type of the geometry, uh, the OSM database for POIs. And it's also POIs, uh, OSM only. Um, but you can see more on the rate limits uh, side. So if you want to check it out, that's uh, a good stop. And if you do not want to use our API because you're commercial and we do not want to give you more than 2,500 requests a day, um, then you can also install it locally. In fact, you could do it right now. Uh, shouldn't take that long. So you just clone it and uh, you run it with Docker. And it's a 10-minute process. And it will give you, well, by default, it will give you Heidelberg, which is, you know, doesn't have that many applications. But you can um, configure the, it's, there's an app uh, config file where you can just disable, enable services, and uh, also can provide a planet PDF if you want to. But I got to tell you, it's really resource intensive. So if you want to root on the whole planet and you want to use all the options that we offer, which is quite a bit more than a Graphhopper stack actually offers, you should be looking at, depending on the profile you're using, up to 128 gigs of RAM. Then you want to have that redundant, so you double that. It can be quite costly. Um, so the 128 gigabytes would be more for a driving profile with all options enabled, while or a car, like classical vehicle profile. Um, while uh, the 64-bit, it might be enough for a bike profile, so just for bicycling. Oh, just to get the terminology right, profile, I'm meaning mode of transport. Right? And um, so the geocoding and the uh, POI endpoints, they need a bit of special setup. Um, since geocoding is a Pelea stack, so you can have a look at that project on GitHub. And the uh, open POI service is actually something that we, um, we outsourced. So before it was part of the stack of our, um, of the whole Java stack of open root service. Now we made that a small Flask application that you can install separately and really run at least like Europe on a tiny machine. So it's, uh, I really like that one because it doesn't need to be part of a routing service, right? It doesn't have anything to do with routing. So I'm going to show you a bit about our architecture. Um, when we have an incoming request, it will pass our gateway, which is uh, also redundant. So we have two servers that um, serve as a gateway. And uh, that will decide if you're eligible. So you provide an API key, it checks against our database. And if that API key is in the database, then uh, the request will be forwarded to our REST in interface. And that one um, is basically just a setup of five different endpoints, which is a directions, matrix, isochrons, geocoding, and POIs. And to be fair, so that the, the whole routing engine itself, like I said, is Graphhopper. Mm. The matrix code is something that we implemented ourselves, but developed it was really um, at the Karlsruhe Institute of, Institute of Technology. Um, so the OSRM people, basically. But we're not, to be clear, we're not um, really algorithmic guys. So we're, more, we're, we're really good at implementing stuff, but mostly from the base research uh, of um, other institutes. Um, the isochrons API, though, that, that is um, our, our doing. Geocoding, like I said, Pelias, uh, XMAPSEN. And POIs is also something that we developed entirely. But it's fairly simple, though. So right now, as I said, we're heavily underutilized. We, have about two to 300,000 requests a day. Uh, but our potential usage, of course, depending on which, um, which request you do, is uh, 20 million a day. 
So our infrastructure is uh, growing, actually. So we offer quite a few clients to talk to our API natively. So we got a Python client, R client, a QGIS plugin. And you can also download the web app on GitHub and host it yourself. If you didn't see it yet, go to maps.openrootservice.org. And we also, like I said, we had this uh, open PY service, which is a small Flask application, so it can serve as a REST API on your local computer if you want, or on a server. And it's also fully customizable in a Docker setup. And it automatically creates, drops, and populates the um, post-GIS tables in the background. Which is coming soon is the Open Fuel service. I'm really looking forward to that one. So we'll um, basically estimate your fuel consumption on up to 600 car models. Um, and it takes a GeoJSON as input and the car model, and it will estimate, sort of well estimate, um, your fuel consumption based on an open database for car models. With, um, I think it's from the EU something. Uh, but it's, uh, it's well tested. It's not the official manufacturer values, right? Because they're not really reliable. Um, so you basically we have our base URL, api.openrootservice.org. Then you just append the, any endpoint that you want to use, directions, isochrones, geocode. And you can um, either curl it directly in a command line or use our Python or R client, which is fairly new. And now the directions API, we have, um, we have 10 routing profiles, which is, I think, more than most other routing services have, uh, which uh, the wheelchair one is actually the one that, that really stands out. Um, so we're offering, at least in Germany, we're offering wheelchair routing. It was just uh, recently a project finished um, with Heidelberg to offer proper wheelchair routing, like get the height of the curbs and Compliantly <coughs> route um, for routing for wheelchairs, and the output form is it's um, it's JSON, but it's recently it's also GeoJSON, so you can you know, if you're programmatically accessing it, pipe it directly into uh, other applications that take GeoJSON as input, and you can also get extra information on steepness of your routes or or your route segments uh, on surface which surface you are traveling on and also get information about tollways, which is especially interesting for logistic companies. And we have quite a few um, other functionalities that are a bit more hidden. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them now because I'm running low on time. Um, but uh, one that is really, um, so green, green and quiet routing, I find that quite interesting. So if you want to um, take a walk, just a hike, not go from A to B, but just walk around then uh, you can give the option of green routing and it will sort of try to um, pass parks and you know anything that's on the way that is an OSM and marked as a natural area. Right, and we also have landmark based um, or backed pedestrian navigation, which is, so those two things are only available in Germany right now. So it's a proof of concept and, um, but it will be rolled out soon for the whole world. Um, so this is an interactive notebook. It's a Python notebook, a uh, Jupyter notebook. I decided to um, to give it a try. Um, if you, I can show you the. So this is what it really looks like. And you can go into presentation mode, and it's supposed to be interactive mapping of um, you know usage of our API, right? So I'm going to use Python, and. Um, this whole project or the whole presentation is on GitHub too, so you will see a link in the end. So you can go and have a look in calmly. So I'm not going to spend any time uh, really explaining the code. I'm just going to run it. And then there's something called Python widgets. You cannot see anything. I yeah, no. So in this case, we want to avoid features for a cycling profile, right? So we want to go from Heidelberg city center somewhere up the hill. And now you can avoid, okay, I have to look at it as well. So on this one here, there's none. It says none right there. So that means there's no restrictions. So we don't avoid anything. But you can see that, um, that it roots right here and 
that you want to go here, which is quite a lot higher. So the shortest route would be right over the hills. You don't really see it. I didn't put an elevation profile, which I should have done really. But um, this is quite steep areas here, right? And it's like pass. It's not a road. And if you want to avoid hills, you can just tell it, no, I don't want to go hills. And then it routes you um, over the street, which is a lot less steep for the most part. And then we also can avoid countries, which is sort of unique. Um, so if you, we had a case like that in my former company once, so we were a sort of logistics uh, company and, um, and we didn't want to go through Switzerland because Switzerland is, uh, you know, you got customs and you got to clear it and they're sometimes being a bit anal about it. So um, you can just say to avoid Switzerland. So we're routing from Heidelberg down to Milan and it's going right through Switzerland, right? So if you don't want that, and actually, yeah, you cannot see it either. So this here is saying Switzerland, what I'm clicking on now, right? So this will hopefully avoid Switzerland. It takes some time, it's very expensive to compute, very expensive. Uh, it will take like 10 seconds, I guess. Um, but eventually, it will avoid Switzerland and go through Austria. And the logistics company is happy. And then I'm just going to show quickly the route green or quiet. So here it says green, here it says quiet, here it says none. Okay. Um, so this is just a route again in Heidelberg. And we're just walking somewhere from the western city over the Neckar, somewhere in the northern part. And this would be on the main road and it's not really nice to walk on. So you can just give it the option of green routing and it will try to stick more to the, um, to the park up here or the forest really. It will take a bit longer, obviously, but um, it might be more pleasant, which is worth a lot. Actually, there's also a quiet profile, um, which looks like it's even more sticking to the forest which is a bit surprising. Um, but you can have a look at the specifics. It's documented on our homepage um, about how those profiles affect the routing behavior. OK, so then we got our isochrones API. And that one also takes all of our profiles. And it's basically creating, uh, you give it a location or multiple locations. You can give up to five and 10 intervals in one request. So you get up to 50 isochrons if you want. And uh, you can also give in attributes. So actually, it's supposed to be reachability analysis, right? So um, we return data, in this case, from a European uh, global human settlement layer, which has a 250 by 250 meter um, population database for the whole world. And if we execute that. You cannot see it either, but this says time, this says distance, so you can query in both dimensions. Also, that will take a little bit because I'm actually going for Milan, Heidelberg, and Berlin, uh, some random points there, and I'm requesting an hour. No. How much am I requesting? I think half an hour of uh, half an hour, 30 kilometers, depending on the dimension. Uh, and then you get actually the population back. Can't see it? No. So it's basically saying four and a half million people live in Berlin within half an hour reach. And the same pretty much goes for Milan down here, which has almost seven million. So some people say our oh, isochrones are a bit lazy because they're, um, it's not donut polygons. So it's basically just a shell of multiple, um, of multiple finer grain polygons that you would get out of an isochrone eventually. Uh, so if you look at OSRM isochrones, they're usually a bit more detailed, or a lot more detailed. And we're about to change that behavior too on our side. 
because a lot of people say this is like a radius, right? And they're sort of right. Um, Geocoding API, I'm not going to talk about that too long now. Uh, you can have a look at the Pilias uh, documentation for that. Uh, but it's very nice service. It's very modular. It's easy to set up. And uh, most of their extra services can be used as standalone APIs, which is really nice. And then I'm just going to show you a, uh, so how many cities with the same name exist on the planet. And here we got Heidelberg, Milan, and Springfield. So if you ever wondered how many Springfields there actually are, let's give it a go. So Mono Springfield worldwide is 32, out of which 26 are in the US. Even Milan is, um, is 14 worldwide. Again, 11 in the US. Even Heidelberg. We we'll think it's uh, most of them German or well German speaking countries, but no, half of them are in the U.S. <laughs> I really find that funny. Uh, so then we also have the Matrix API and the POI API, Points of Interest API. I'm not going to show any uh, any example for the Matrix API, but uh, you can query 50 by 50 locations. You don't get geometry return, but distance and duration, which helps for your optimization. And our POI API is basically the open POI service, um, which is a microservice. And you can query up to five categories or all within a single request. And it's limited to, I think, 2,000 uh, POIs to be returned. So it's quite a huge JSON that, is, uh, that you will get. And just that one more example, right? Then I'm done. So here we just query the POIs around um, our state of the map location within one kilometer, all POIs, which actually turns out to be a long list. But there's, for example, an ATM, which I could have used last night. Should have actually tried my own notebook. Um, so there's three ATMs within a kilometer around us. Probably the most, for today's afternoon, most important one would be a swimming pool. And there's four around us. And I'm definitely going to head in one of them. And I think that's it. I got a couple more slides. Um, this is actually like a proper Jupyter notebook, what's coming now. Um, but you can see the GitHub link at right here. So you can download that notebook and play around. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Niels. We have time for a few questions. Yeah, so you're using different uh, tools in the background for different API endpoints, like, for example, directions and metrics. Uh, I was wondering how you managed to have some consistency between those two. Like, if I compute a matrix and use one of the travel times, uh, do I have um, a guarantee that I'll get the same travel time with the root endpoint direction? Yeah, it is using different algorithms. So depending on what sort of requests you do, if you just use a plain um, A to B, I want to go from Heidelberg to Milano with my car request, right? No dynamic um, properties in there, like vehicle dimensions or something. It's using uh, the contraction hierarchies, right? So it's, uh, it's actually it's using a different algorithm than when, when you're querying a matrix API, which uh, there it's using RFAST. Uh, from the Katsu Institute of Technology. And the graph hopper stack actually allows very elegantly to um, add different algorithms to its stack. And that's what we did. Did that answer your question a bit? If not, come see me. <laughs> so what do you think is the biggest issue with OSM data for routing? Biggest issue with OSM data? When used for routing. Routing, right. Uh, sorry, I'm always calling it routing. Uh, yeah, for routing. Uh, the biggest issue is I think that um, a lot of tags are not complete. 
So especially the dynamic requests, um, if you want to specify vehicle dimensions in order to avoid crashing your truck into a bridge, right, which happens on a regular basis, you would be surprised how often that happens. Um, and that is, unfortunately, it's not really all over the place. It's very seldom, actually, that it's, that it's tagged the right way. Um, also, but we do account for that um, for the next problem, which is um, that uh, often nodes, like a, like a bridge, or let's say a bridge going above a highway, right? And the bridge has, a, or the, in that case, the node has a, a height property but it's irrelevant for that node for routing, it's relevant for the street below. Ah. So that's, um, I mean, you can account for that, right? You can do some pre-processing, and we do that, but uh, it's not that nice. So yeah, it's, it's amount of tags or the right tags and um, a few other things. Other questions? Okay, so we can close here. Thank you again, Nils. Thank you very much.